It's Batman and Robin, not Robin and Batman. And I'm sick of it. Yes. These videos are not for children. If you're a children, then piss off. Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso. And I've previously talked about the movie Batman and Robin on this channel before. In my The Day It Died series, I talked about how this movie not only destroyed this continuity of Batman films, but also almost destroyed Batman in cinema, and the concept of superhero movies for quite some time. I also did a bad movie night where me and a couple of my friends watched Batman and Robin and provided our own drunken commentary. But today, I've decided to challenge myself by trying to list 101 good things about this movie. And yes, I am for real. Hey, uh, just was wondering, is this uh, an out-of-season April Fool's joke? However, I want to put a little asterisk there because I don't know if I'm going to make it to 101. That's my goal, yes, but... Uh, well, you've seen this movie before, right? This isn't exactly going to be an easy task. So with that being said, let's get right into it. Let's go ahead and try to find the light in this everlasting darkness. 101 Good Things About Batman and Robin Number 1. It's a Batman movie. This may sound like a cop-out, but even the worst Batman movie is still at least a Batman movie. So, they got that going for them. I love Batman even at his very worst. So I still love Batman here. I just love him significantly less than I've loved Batman in almost anything else, but there's still love. There is still love. The soundtrack. Look, say what you will about the writing, directing, acting, casting, and filming of this movie, but you gotta admit, at the very least, they did manage to have a soundtrack that feels very Batman. Even if the movie itself does not. The suits. Honestly, bat nipples and cod pieces aside, I've always thought these suits were actually pretty good. Especially Mr. Freeze's. I mean, come on, look at that, are you kidding me? I just wish it was in a better movie. Robin rocking the full-on Nightwing costume with the added benefit of a cape? What's not to love about that? Seriously, if they just took the nipples off of Batman, I think that there would be a lot more positive to talk about here, at least in the wardrobe department. I just find Joel's excuse of this Greek gladiator thing that he was allegedly going for to be a strange cop-out. Like, I understand what he was going for, but that is not what the end result looks like. It feels a lot more like a weird, unneeded sexualization of characters. Honestly, this would be like if Poison Ivy's onesie came with a butt flap. Like, like what is going on here? What is it for? Like, yeah, sure, okay, Joel, you put them in these outfits so they look like gods. Not to bring whatever weird fetish it is that you have to the big screen. Sure. Sure. And I believe that the same way I believe that the creators of Power Girl gave her that boob window to show that she doesn't have an emblem because she doesn't know what she stands for. Of course, it's all symbolic. I'm just too simple of a person and I read it as perversion. Look, there's no shame in it, but let's just call it for what it is. Like, don't try to legitimize it. You know why you did what you did. Just own up to it. That's all I'm saying. Focus on Alfred. I think one of the best things one of the worst movies of all time does is focus more on Alfred. Michael Gal was really memorable in the role, even if I cannot properly remember his name. And he was one of only two actors to have stayed the course from Keaton to Kilmer to Clooney. It's nice to see the actor and the character be given their roses here. It sucks that it was in this movie, but it was nice to see him being remembered and actually taking part in one of the main plots of the feature. More than in any other one of the Batman movies in this lineup, Alfred actually has something to do here. Even if that something to do was die. Mr. Freeze's backstory. Yes, Mr. Freeze was terribly miscast and mischaracterized throughout the film. No one is going to argue that, and if they do, then they are stupid. But I do at the very least want to credit Joel Schumacher for giving the character the tragic backstory that was created in Batman the Animated Series. Many may forget that that story was only a few years old at this point in time, and not every continuity out wrote Mr. Freeze as this tragic figure who did bad things for a good cause. So Joel, rest in peace, Thank you for making Mr. Freeze's wife a popsicle. Toys. This movie was made to sell toys. And it's made pretty apparent within the first couple minutes of its runtime, when everything in the movie already looks like it belongs on a Toys R Us shelf. But honestly, if the goal was to sell toys, I haven't fact-checked this, but I gotta think that they probably met that goal. 
because those toys were lit. I had a whole bunch of them. And even now, they still kind of look cool to me. I mean, I'm not going to play with them now because I'm pushing 30, but I would put them up on display in my household, even though I'm pushing 30. The movie is fun. Okay, hear me out. I know that we're only seven in, and it already seems like I'm grasping at straws here, but this movie is fun. It's bad, yes. Uh, very bad. Awful, in fact. Terrible, actually. But it's a fun kind of bad. And it's a fun kind of bad that you just don't always see in bad movies. This movie, in spite of itself, is highly entertaining. Even if it's not entertaining for the right reasons, it's still a fun hate watch. I think it's always better to be bad than boring. John Glover. My man John Glover belongs in the DC Hall of Fame. Not for his role here as the pre-Floronic man, but it adds to his overall DC resume. Also on that same resume is his time in Batman the Animated Series as the Riddler, playing Dr. Savannah's dad in Shazam, and of course, playing Lex Luthor's father Lionel in Smallville. So it's just nice to see him in a DC-related project, because it reminds me of all the much better DC-related projects that he's been a part of. All projects I really wish I was taking a look at, as opposed to re-watching this. Three villains for the price of one. They really did try to go all out and showcase not one, not two, but three separate Batman villains in the movie's runtime. That is something that just doesn't always happen in superhero movies. And it certainly wasn't something that happened a lot back in the day. Well, outside of that one time in that one other Batman movie. Sure, the villains come together to plot and scheme as a group, and Bane really does just become the muscle of that group, but still... An effort was made, and I think that that deserves to be praised. Three heroes for the price of one. So the same thing I just said before in that last entry? That again, but, but with the good guys this time. Three is a lot more than we usually got. George Clooney. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Again, hear me out. Yes, George Clooney was a god-awful, irredeemable Batman. A fact that even George himself has admitted to on numerous occasions. But I do think as the public persona of Bruce Wayne goes, George Clooney was a great choice. Whether by design, accident, or coincidence, you can completely buy George Clooney being a smarmy billionaire playboy. As a matter of fact, I would say that that's the role George was born to play. He's been working at it all his life. I think the scenes in which we see him as Bruce, especially when he's out in public, really work for the character and really work in favor of the movie. The problem is, is most of his runtime is with the mask on, and when you put the mask on the guy, he just, he's just George Clooney in a mask. But a believable Bruce Wayne persona nonetheless. Gossip Gertie. I gotta hand it to these movies for including the wife of Batman co-creator Bob Kane. It's a cute little cameo, and I think it's a nice little touch. I'm starting to find that this movie has a bunch of nice things happening in the background, while the forefront is cluttered by a bunch of bat shit. This movie is total guano, no doubt. But I think it's a really nice touch having Batman co-creator Bob Kane's wife involved in the project as one of the characters. Hints at an extended universe. Give it to those in charge, they knew what we wanted. They just weren't ready to give it to us. Only a few seconds into the movie, we're already mentioning Superman, having the Floronic Man as a side character, and putting Dick Grayson in the Nightwing costume. Once again, these are all really nice things. If only they were in a better movie. The Batmobile. Even if the Batmobile has been better in every movie that was out before this one, this one's still kind of sick. It's very, uh, toyetic of them. But seriously, it, it, it's pretty cool. I'm sorry, that, that was an unintentional ice pun. Mr. Freeze's henchmen are kind of cool. See, now that time, it was intentional. These goons look like total goofs once they're unmasked and made to sing my favorite Christmas carols. But their getup is otherwise kind of dope. Like, it doesn't work for Mr. Freeze's henchmen, that's not what I'm saying at all, but if Casey Jones ever did a little dance number, they would be shoe-ins for his backup dancers. Bill Finger doesn't get his credit. Now, normally, this is a really sad fact about Batman content made before Batman v Superman. Bill Finger, the brilliant mind behind Batman, more so than Bob Kane, never truly gets the credit he was so desperately and deliberately due. However, in this one isolated case, I'm gonna go ahead and say it probably worked out for the best for him in this. 
you know, this way he doesn't have any kind of association with this abomination of a Batman movie. There's your silver lining. Faithful adaptation. Look, say what you will about this movie, and most of the things that you say will probably be true. But to say that this isn't a faithful adaptation tonally of Batman is to have never watched the 1960s Batman show. Now granted, this movie was supposed to take place in the originally established Tim Burton Batman universe, and the very idea that this brightly lit two-hour toy commercial for kids is somehow connected to the dark, gritty, and grimy Batman Returns is borderline unthinkable. So I will give you that. This movie is bad for its already established timeline, and it's bad for the time period that it came out in. But I do think it succeeds in being a then-modernized interpretation of the original campy and goofy Batman that Adam West made famous. It's far from my favorite use of the characters or the lore or the anything, really. But if the goal was to adapt the old Batman for a new audience, I would say that they mostly did a good job. However, they did a terrible job in reading the room. Because this movie was made at a time where people wanted to move past Batman's Golden Age and settle into a decidedly much darker night. I think it fails as being a sequel to the Batman movies that came before it, but it succeeds as being the successor of the 1960s Adam West show. So, do what you will with that information. The Robin cycle is dope. It's a short entry because, honestly, what more needs to be said? Robin had a sick pair of wings. By which I mean, Robin had a sick pair of wheels. Callbacks. More than the already previously established canon within the series, this movie makes a lot of callbacks. Batman and Batman Returns hardly even seem connected. And Batman Forever only made one passing reference to Batman's former flame Catwoman. But Batman and Robin is constantly addressing its past. Maybe in an attempt to distract you from its present. What with Two-Face and the Riddler costumes from the last entry inside Arkham? Weird that they'd have Two-Face considering he's all dead now, but yeah, okay, I'm not complaining. Too much. Robin makes several references to his family, the Flying Graysons. You got the Neon Gang that looks more at home in a Prodigy music video coming back. Good to see them. And you even have this one Easter egg of the Joker, which by the way, all these years I have never noticed that until re-watching it for this video. Commissioner Gordon. These movies do a huge disservice to Jim Gordon. There's a promising start in his first appearance, but since then his role has just gone downhill. And the character has been completely devalued by the time we get to Batman and Robin. And it annoys me because we're never really shown his relationship with Batman in these, we're just told of it. Still, regardless, the fact that he had any presence at all in this one is a nice little trip down memory lane. And I feel nostalgic seeing him in this movie because it reminds me of what came before. Alfred's niece. Now this one pissed me off a lot back in the day. Because Batgirl isn't Alfred's niece, she's Commissioner Gordon's daughter. But honestly, if I'm being real with y'all, with the way this series diminished the character of Commissioner Gordon and took what was a dignified character and turned him into a dopey punchline, it's probably better off that they shifted gears. I don't love this overall direction, but... I do at the very least understand it. It's not ideal, but they did what they could with what they had already. Though why she isn't British is beyond me, but yeah, sure, whatever, okay. Not gonna put too much thought into it because the people making this didn't put too much thought into it. Pacing. The pacing of this movie is surprisingly not an issue. Which is saying a lot when you're taking into account that it's introducing and establishing three new villains, all with their own unique origin stories, acquainting its audience with a new Batman that they're trying to endear them to, focusing on Alfred's illness, the sudden appearance of his niece, creating a strange love triangle between the dynamic duo and Gotham's latest big bad, Poison Ivy, and having Mr. Freeze threaten to freeze Gotham City, and so on. Despite all the narratives at work in this movie, it does manage to juggle them and squeeze them into the runtime just fine. Like, obviously they're not done to perfection, but the movie is fairly coherent against all odds. Less coherent is the thought process that went into making this movie. Although less coherent is the thought process that went into making this movie. Alfred and Bruce. This movie is remembered for all the bad it brings. And that's probably because it brought a whole lot. The awful ice puns, the over-the-top hammy acting, the careless delivery of all of Batman's lines. But what's less remembered, and often overlooked, 
are the actually surprisingly sweet interactions between Bruce Wayne and Alfred. Even if everything else about George Clooney's performance feels fictitious, this stands out as the contrary, because in the scenes that he shares with Michael Gow, they actually feel really genuine. Their back and forths and everyday interactions feel like that of a father and son. I would put this as one of the movie's greatest attributes. Strangely enough, I think the chemistry between these two is actually the strongest between Michael Gow and any of the other Batman actors. And I'm genuinely surprised not more people talk about this. People usually don't go to Batman movies to see Batman and Alfred interact, they go to see Batman be Batman. And this movie does not excel with Batman. Family, 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 family. I do like that this movie has a focus on family. The ones that you're born to and the ones that you choose over time. When trying to make these movies follow one steady narrative, which, like this list, is no easy task, one could see this as an evolution of the Bruce Wayne character. Starting off as an isolated loner who shuns the public and any chance of a personal life, over the years come into his own, accept his own public persona, accept his life outside the cape and cowl, and now he's out here taking in orphans and starting a family of his own. It's nice to see this growth. To see him in the company of others like him, surrounded by apprentices and peers that join him in his fight for justice. Honestly, it's almost endearing. But as with everything else, I would have preferred to see this done in a better movie. Regardless, it was the closest we got to seeing Batman head the Batman family for quite some time. And I give it an A for effort. A D for delivery, but an A for effort. Poison Ivy. Now, I initially struggled with adding this one to the list because I have mixed feelings on this performance. Yes, Uma Thurman is extremely over the top, and the Poison Ivy character in this is so ridiculously ridiculous, but at the end of the day, it leaves an impression. And I think that Uma Thurman really bounces back and forth from being ironically entertaining to unironically entertaining. Regardless, she's really going for it here, and I think that she stands out in a room full of monotoned, neutered performances. This Poison Ivy demands attention. And more than Batman, Robin, Mr. Freeze, Batgirl, or Bane, I think Poison Ivy is the standout character of this movie. Uma Thurman's having fun, and it really shows. If there was any actor in this movie that I'd be interested in seeing return to the role they played, it'd have to be Uma with Chris O'Donnell being a shoe-in for second. But that's mainly just because I think the guy deserves another shot. Yes, he was terrible in Batman and Robin, but he was okay in Batman Forever, I swear! Patrick Leahy. I've always wanted to talk about this in a video, but I've never had a video that I could mention it in until now. But U.S. Senator Patrick Leahy is a huge Batman fan, and that's why he makes a cameo appearance in this movie right over here. And I think the guy stands out with his over-the-top hammy expressions more than any other extra in the scene. And his sudden appearance makes this scene a little bit more watchable for me. It should be mentioned that this wasn't his only entrance into the world of Batman, as the Senator has also played in other Batman projects, such as this appearance in The Dark Knight, and this appearance in its follow-up, The Dark Knight Rises. He also voiced the Governor in Batman the Animated Series. I mean, there's fan service, and then there's literally servicing your fans. I like it. Look at him out there living my dream. So if you're ever watching a Batman movie, make sure that you're on the lookout for this man. There is a good chance that he's included somewhere. More governors. Speaking of governors, not only was former governor of California Arnold Schwarzenegger top billed in the movie, obviously playing Mr. Freeze if you haven't caught on, but former governor of Minnesota and professional wrestler Jesse the Body Ventura actually makes a cameo appearance as this prison guard. Not a lot of people seem to bring this up. It's probably one of the most glossed over facts of this movie. Which is saying something about the movie itself. Because nobody talks about the Predator reunion on the set of Batman and Robin. More wrestlers. And speaking of wrestlers, not only was former professional wrestler Jesse the Body Ventura in this, but so was then-wrestler Jeep Swenson, in the role of Bane. Here, he was in the role of Bane. It's also thanks to this wrestling inclusion in the movie that we got to see Gotham City on an episode of WCW Monday Nitro. Oh, look at that. It's the crossover I never needed, and nor did I ask for it. Some of the visuals are well done. I feel like a lot of this movie would have worked better as a slideshow. 
it doesn't always look great. I mean, sometimes it actually looks downright goofy. But when it's not looking like a really expensive school play, it could actually look downright beautiful. However, these shots feel completely out of place in the movie that they're in. A lot of these visuals are really well done, but they don't fit with the tone, and they certainly don't fit with the dopey nature this movie has already established. So on their own, they're good, but in context, they are a little out of sorts. A cool cameo. Is that Coolio? Did Coolio just show up in my Batman movie? you damn right he did! However, if this video was point-based, I'd have to deduct a few points. Due to a lack of an ice pun being made at the expense of his name. Awful. If there was ever the movie to do that in, it would very obviously be this one. What a waste of an opportunity. Another kind of cool cameo. Oh, so what the fuck is Corey Haim doing here? Alright, you're pushing it for me, but I'll include it, sure, because no one else is going to talk about it. Corey Haim is in Batman and Robin. Thank you, Joel Schumacher. The makeup is pretty good. Look, I can't deny it, Mr. Freeze looks really awesome in this movie. His icy blue skin looks great on screen. And there's sort of an icicle shine to his appearance. I don't know what it is, but I like it. I mean, feel free to disagree with me in the comment section below, but I dig it. I think it was good. Also, Poison Ivy's makeup? Not bad. I'm a fan. Connecting the canon. This is just a little something, but to a nerd like me who appreciates world building and following a continuity through, this means everything. Technically speaking, this isn't Arnold Schwarzenegger's first appearance in these Batman movies. You lie! As just two entries prior, a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger shows up in Max Shrek's office, standing side to side with the man himself. Should you read a little bit more into this, like, I and many other nerds would, you can make an argument that this is actually a young Victor Freeze meeting with Max Shrek, legitimizing the hardly established timeline of these movies. Don't get me wrong, this obviously wasn't the original intention of the picture's inclusion, but hey, it's a happy accident that could prove it's canon, so I'm gonna go with it, I'm putting it in here. Julie Madison Julie Madison didn't have a whole lot to do in the movie. As a matter of fact, there were probably a lot of people who watched the movie all the way through, and had no idea what her name was. Julie is Bruce's girlfriend in this movie. She's barely introduced, and she just kind of sticks around during the movie's runtime, serving no real point or purpose, other than to be Bruce's pretty girlfriend. You have a lot of help. But in the comics, she was actually one of the Dark Knight's first love interests. So seeing her on the big screen is kind of nice, rather than being replaced by someone they created exclusively for the movies. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Dr. Chase Meridian. If that is your real name, which it's not because you don't have one, because you're not a real person, Gotham has a personality. Is this the perfect representation of Gotham City? Certainly not. It's nowhere near as dark and grimy as you would expect. We're not dealing with Burton's Gotham or Reeves's Gotham, but Schumacher's Gotham does have a personality all its own. A massive, mostly crime-ridden city where an over-the-top cartoony criminal underworld takes center stage. Where gangs look like they're better suited at a rave. Where giant statues of muscular men are intertwined in buildings' architecture. Where it's mostly night 24 hours of the day, and neon signs light the city streets. I don't love this take on Gotham City, but I do have some fondness for it, and I do appreciate it. I like this strange state that Joel's conjured up. It feels different. It feels unique. It's not my Gotham City, but it is Joel Schumacher's, and I dig it. Although I will say some of the props in the city are just a little bit out there. Like, for example, this. That's the weirdest fucking lava lamp I've ever seen in my life. Bane has a good scene. Bane doesn't get a whole lot to do in this movie other than be strong and stupid, which is also how I would describe my cousin, so he's not really all that special. There's not a whole lot to like or dislike in this performance. He's just supposed to stand around, look intimidating, and occasionally repeat a word that was said by someone else. That's it. The one moment I remember always liking from this movie with Bane, though, was the scene in which he knocks down the bad signal. I mean, it's not as great as when it was done in the animated series, but it's still kind of cool. And I hope you enjoyed this scene as much as I did, because that's as good as it's going to get for Bane in this movie. It's all downhill from here. It was also downhill prior to here, but the Batcave. I don't really like the glitchy Max Headroom Alfred AI that they got going on here. That's not for me. 
I, I mean, who does the guy think he is, Jarvis? But outside of that, I'm really loving this Batcave. We don't get to see a whole lot of it, unfortunately, but the few glimpses we get inside are runtime well spent. A Robin signal in the sky. I'm only putting this on here because I'm such a huge Dick Grayson fan, and this will be the first and last time that guy ever sees his logo up in the sky. Good for him, he deserves it. Once again, like everything else, wish it was in a better movie. The heroes and villains feel larger than life. You gotta hand it to this movie if it does anything right. It highlights its main pro and antagonists by making them feel entirely over the top. From their props, to their costumes, to Ivy's several wardrobe changes throughout. These characters really feel like old school comic book characters. Undoubtedly, that's what Joel was going for. And in some respect, I kind of feel like the guy hit the nail on the head. Batman saves. I think more than in previous installments, here we see Batman save people. And not just his girlfriends or his ward, but save random citizens of Gotham City. Save his colleagues. Save the villain. And to me, that's the Batman I know. Which brings me to my next point. Batman doesn't kill. More than in any of the other at the time previously made Batman movies, Batman's affinity for human life is on full display. This time around, he doesn't kill his villain, nor is he in any way responsible for their death. Yeah, Joel, that was real sweet what you did to Harvey. That totally doesn't count as Batman killing a man because he allowed him to kill himself. Sick loophole. But in Batman and Robin, he goes out of his way to save the main villain, even after he straight up tells him to kill him. This movie ends with Batman putting his villains in Arkham Asylum, just like the Batman I know would. A different side to Batman. Yes, this is one of the worst Batman performances of all time. I I'm not disputing that, and I think most rational-minded people would. As a matter of fact, off the top of my head, I can't think of someone I disliked in this role more. But this movie does seem to get some things about the character right. Things that even past interpretations out at the time didn't get. This movie is lacking in making Batman a broody stranger in the shadows. But it does triumph in showcasing Batman's compassion. Which, contrary to popular belief, is actually a very big part of the character. This Batman inspires hope in a villain directly after delivering him a defeat. The previous two Batman just killed their villains. Carelessly. Apology. Because of this movie's faults and flaws, it has at least elicited several apologies from several different people who worked on it. Both director Joel Schumacher and star George Clooney have apologized for the movie many times over the years. So, you know, at least they said sorry, because somebody had to. An apology goes a long way with me, so gentlemen, you are forgiven. Still waiting on that apology for Morbius, though. Standards. Arnold Schwarzenegger, despite being the top-billed name, apparently didn't share the screen with all of his co-stars. Chris O'Donnell has stated that he never worked on set with Arnie, despite Robin sharing several scenes with Mr. Freeze. Apparently, all of this was achieved with the use of stand-ins. And it really isn't all that noticeable, unless you were told. Arnold's stand-in, due to the makeup that was used and the ridiculous add-ons of the suit, looks almost identical to the Stogie Lover. Allegedly, Arnold was only used in close-ups of most scenes. Is this the best way to use an actor and tell a story? No, probably not. But I give it to them because the final product doesn't feel like it suffers from this decision. This could have very easily been season one of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That's all I'm saying. I also think it adds a little bit more fun to the overall product. You know, if you have to sit down and watch this movie, now you sit down and you try to pick apart shots and point out when Arnie clocked out on that day of shooting. All right, guys, that looks like where we're going to end part one of the series. I want to apologize now because going into this, I didn't know I would be breaking it down into parts. However, this video has been taking a super long time to make, and I don't want to keep you all waiting for the next video. So thank you for tuning in and joining me yet again. If you liked the video, let me know in the comment section below by using the phrase, Batman and Robin is cool. I know it probably pains you to say such words, and I know how untrue they probably are. But just know that it helps me know that you want to see part two sooner than later. With all that being said, though, I was your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso. You were the V-Generates, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. I am vengeance. I am the knight, and that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, 
and you too would like to become a V-Generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.